how's it going? I'm Mark Brownstein from the Disco Biscuits. I'm hanging out here with Ryan Storm from Storm Sounds. And we are back here at the Town Ballroom and we're gonna give you an updated rig rundown with a little bit of uh, examples of what the sounds are sounding like these days. So, uh, where should we start? Let's start with, uh, let's start with, the, with our uh, effects here. So, you know, this is my ground control. This is a MIDI uh, system that's, that's controlling all of my pedals, which all live here uh, in a stack. And I run it this way so that if any, um, any of the chords fail or anything, my uh, signal continues going out to the front of house. So there's an effects loop that's separate from my regular DI clean line. So they're always getting the clean signal out front. So unless the actual chord here on the bass breaks, uh, nothing can ever go out. Um, so let's start with my newest baby here. This is the flanger. Let's take a look at it over here. Classic. They don't make this anymore. This is an is Ibanez. They call it the yellow flanger. And uh, I was uh, over hanging out at uh, Jonathan Coleman from Muscle Tuff's house, and I was playing around with his rig, and that was uh, on it. And I just loved the sound so much, so I actually just went right on and bought it right there, then and there. And there's the sound. Just absolutely wonderful. And then uh, over here, this is my future impact. I, I don't use this pedal a lot, but it's um, it's a synth pedal that has been a kind of a replacement pedal for people who use the deep impact, which is by a kind not made anymore. I'm not using it is because my boss bass bass synth pedal which I've this is the SYB5 I've had this thing since the very very beginning of being in the band and uh, I didn't use it for many many years and then earlier this year I went and sat down with it and I found a sound and so I've got a uh, EV5 cutoff pedal here this is hooked up to the cutoff frequency and I'm able to control the frequencies that are coming through the pedal so it gives a really like electronic effect where you get just the subs when it's all the way down and as, as you open it up formerly a uh, effect that was reserved for the keyboard players but now uh now stringed instrument guys have all of the wares that are needed in order to pull these things up. And so this is the sound I'm using in, the, in our new song, Dino Baby. And it, it's actually, it's bone rattling. Like when we turn it on up here, you know, you can feel your body shake and it, it, it combines um, an octave pedal, which brings in an octave down below the signal, but with a synth pedal at the same time. So it's a kind of a dual sound there. Speaking of the octave pedal. That's the octave pedal. This is a new one. This is the OC5. Um, and it's totally streamlined. And uh, I set it up a little differently than I have in the past. I used to just run the octave below with none of the regular signal coming in but I've added in my clean signal as well, which gives it a little bit more shake. I might use this one in crickets. I might... Brighter like a caterpillar. And it's just like a nice way to get an electronic sounding, subby electronic sounding bass tone. When sometimes when you're playing electronic music and you're just running a clean tone, it just doesn't punch through everything that's going on, so you need to add some some zhuzh in. So this is this pedal here is the Mutron. Um, this is this is the great 
I mean, this is sort of the holy grail of my rig right here. This is a Mutron 3 Musitronics. It's from the, the early 1970s. There's a couple of versions, three now, of the Mutron 3 pedal. The first was made by Musitronics, and then in the 90s, a company called Haz came along. Um, and we talked about this last year. They, And why it's relevant now is, in the middle of this year, my 1970s Mutron pedal broke down and I had to replace it with the 1990s, which is actually all the 90s version, which was a remake, is now a vintage pedal because they stopped making that and there's a, a new version, which is much smaller, that's being made by, I don't even know who at this point, but they keep selling the license to the name mm -hmm. and new companies are making this pedal, but that is, they're hard to come by. There's a limited amount of them in the world. There's only like one person in the whole country that knows how to fix them when, when. so what, how long was it gone for, Matt? We sent it away and it was gone for like it was gone six gone months or something. Six months and uh, that guy, that guy, um, Lind Lindenberg Sound. Yeah, that's who does it, Lindenberg Sound. If you ever have a Musitronics pedal, you need to get fixed. But thank you, Lindenberg. Jerry Garcia would use a Mutron 3 pedal, and, and that's how he'd get the watery kind of... That watery Jerry sound. You know, I don't really... So it's, it's a classic pedal, and it, it's, it's kind of my favorite thing I got going. Then over here, I got this Mako uh, D1, and this is now my new delay pedal. I haven't really dug into it. sent around to the whole stage so all of our equipment is in sync so if we're playing electronic music and Aaron wants to use an ARP he presses a button down it's coming in exactly in time which is something a lot of bands have struggled with over the years figuring out how to get your ARPs to work if you want to use ARPs in this style of music so our crew is incredible and they they built the system for us where um, John has a helix over here which is controlled by the time clock. I have a uh, sidechain compressor on my Moog over here that can, is controlled by the time clock. And now this delay pedal is also controlled by the time clock. So the band is always totally in sync. And I've talked to other bands who have come to us and been like, how are you guys doing this? Like we're listening to you and everything's completely locked in and in sync. How are, is a live band with live instruments doing that? And our answer is, we won't tell. <laughs> but now everybody knows the trick. The trick is <laughs> you told. We run a we run a master clock off of the computer, and actually we could run it off of Aaron's computer or Alan's computer, and it just is syncing up the whole stage, which is great. You know, I have this Mugerfugger pedal, which is another con kind of a low pass filter, so I could. cuts the signal out of the bass, um, lets only the lows through, uh, and the highs get cut out. And and what happens is in electronic music, if they have like a, a, a line that's being held out, they'll put this compressor on it, and every time the kick drum kicks, the it's called ducks, the, the other, like the arps or like the pads, duck down so that the kick can come through and drive the music, right? And so they want the kick drum to really like be the dominant force in, in house music or techno or trance. And so they use this compressor that makes it so everything kind of quiets when that kick hits. But what happens is when the kick comes off, the music swells up. And I'll show you what that sounds like on the move here, but, but this is like a manual way that bass players do this. And this, I actually learned this from um, Dan Kurtz from the New Deal. You know, he was 
was the first person I saw that had this set up and showed me how to set it up. Although I think I might have told you last time, for the first two years he trolled me and made me and made it sound like a duck quacking. He like set it up <laughs> for me, and I, you know, I'm not great like sound designer, so I just had my bass quacking like a duck for two years before <laughs> he told me how to make the real sound. Before we move on, tell us about the bass. This is a this bass is um. This is an Elric. It's made by Rob Elric in Chicago. And I've had this bass since 2000. Uh, when I rejoined the Biscuits in, in J July 12, 2000, I, I got this Elric. And we went out to Camp Bisco number two. We packed our, our truck up and I'd never used the bass live at a show. I was just joined, rejoining the band and our trailer flipped over on the highway, 476 North. And all of our gear was strewn across the whole highway. We like pulled up behind them, started clearing all of the gear off the highway and nothing amazingly was broken. But then the last thing we checked was the bases and we opened it up and this thing had never been used and it was cracked directly down the neck, just oh. split open. And so we had to send it back and have it rebuilt a second time before it was ever used. So it's the most expensive Elric that ever existed. Bought twice. <laughs> Luckily now I'm, I know the guy and he, and if I, when I buy new Elrics, I get the artist, the artist to deal. Thanks Rob Elric. But uh, like five of my base students bought Elrics last year and um, and I'm hoping that's what's gonna happen with Bergantino. This, uh, let's take a look at this hand. So I've been using the Aguilar Tonehammer 700 for the last couple of years, um, but recently I was up in Vermont playing with the Brownstein family band, which is my son and Jake Brownstein, no relation from Aggie and Donnie from Aggie. And I needed a bass amp and um, Mike Gordon's bass tech, Ed Grassmeyer, said that he would provide me with a, a, a back line. And he showed up with this Bergantino Forte HP2 with a special like cabinet that he had, like totally like juiced up cabinet. And I played it and it was, it was awesome. You know, like usually I try to like, in an attempt to make sure that we don't end up sounding too much like fish because that's the scene that we come out of, I'll try to avoid doing whatever Mike Gordon does, right? So <laughs> Mike Gordon's using a certain kind of something, but also dude's a genius. And like when, if I know that he's using something, I know it's quality, you know, like he's not gonna, he's not gonna go out with a sub quality situation. So um, Karina Reichman then ended up a couple weeks later posting online her Bergantino situation with a speaker cabinet and, and this same head. And I, uh, I, I got in touch with them. They reached out to me like the following week. I, I got like a message, hey, it's the Bergantino people. And I was like, this is amazing. It just seems like this is happening very naturally. Like I tried it out. Then my friend Karina has one. And now I got to reach out. Hey, you know, we're the Bergantino, you know, Jim and Holly Bergantino reached out and they got me in touch with their artist liaison. And then they ended up just coming to the Boston show. They brought this with them. So it's about four shows ago. Uh, they let me use it for the Boston show and then um, kind of the situation sounded like if I liked the way it sounded, I could bring it out on tour. And then the next day they sent me these clips to, to rack mount it so I could rack mount it in my system. And it is spectacular. It is the most clean um, and like driving amp I've ever used. You can turn it way up and it doesn't clip. It doesn't like overdrive. So what's really cool about it is this, this button here, it says punch on it. This is a four and a half dB boost at 100 Hertz. So it's, it's a boost of the bass frequencies and it's an exact boost, you know? So you, sometimes you go to the, like the, the knob, the bass knob and you want to like get more bass, but it's hard to know exactly what you're putting in by turning this knob. But this I know, 100 Hertz, four and a half uh, dB. And for some reason, like right when I pressed it, when we were trying the bass amp out, the frequencies that I feel are missing always from my sound just suddenly showed up. And so what ended up happening was I stopped having to use bass boosts in places where the quality isn't as good as coming from this amplifier. So instead of 
using a, ba a boss bass equalizer pedal and boosting the bass through like a, a third party pedal, which isn't gonna get quite as clean of a sound as if you're boosting it coming out of the Bergantino, um, or, or even boosting it using the preamp on the bass, I could just leave everything flat, leave it all of these boosts off, hit this button, and it just, it rattles. It's so great. So kudos to Mike Gordon's uh, bass tech, Ed Grassmeyer, for introducing me to this incredible piece of equipment. I can't believe how quick it was from when I found out about it to when it's rocking on stage. I'm so happy about it. Um, some other new stuff that we have here is, I, so we went through my Moog last year, Moog. trying to figure out how to make for 28 years now and so when all of these elements are put together we get into a situation where sometimes the music sounds like something that should be being played after 3 a.m you know rather than at 9 p.m <laughs> you know but but it's it's opened up for us a whole world where now when we go and play tractor beam um tractor beam is a completely different band but we're playing our songs and we're bringing all these samples in and doing all this cool stuff, but we're able to like turn on the house music buttons and leave them on for the whole show. And so now we have an alternate version of our band that like if we're playing at an electronic music festival, you know, Electric Forest or something, we, we now know if there's 10,000 kids that are rolling through at any time that are EDM heads, that we have the technology to play some music that to play some music that's absolutely What's going on with the tap tempo? What tempo is that at? We're at 67 right Yeah, now. could you get a 125 or something? Everywhere that you can go, whether it's over here to the straight to the bass synth pedal or using the Moog Froger across my whole entire bass system or here on this Moog expression pedal, every step of the way, I have the ability to cut out the highs from my sound and go subs all the So if I, you know, I could always filter using my hand, but if I'm playing with two hands, I have the ability to filter with the foot, which is totally essential. Now, the other thing that I, I have here, which we just added in, I have a new bass tech, Ben Travers, and he, um, he brought this guy along, and, and this is a, a, a it's a, a MIDI controller that changes the sounds here. So this was a problem I was having was the sounds are like split by like, I, I have number 30 is one sound I use here, but then I want to use number 44 also. So here's 30, and I used to have to. I used to have to pay 
reach through 14 sounds to get to the sound. And it would, it would end up sounding like this. You know, like, <laughs> that's what it sounds like when you're paging through your sound. So now I have this. to add in is a little controller where I can play the notes of this, like all 12 notes of the scale on, with my foot, like a foot controller so that if I'm playing bass and I wanted to have this happen, I can just click this pedal on and then come over here and step on the D note here and that will start coming in so I'll be able to play keyboards and bass at the same time. Um, so that's pretty much it. Uh, one other thing is my last bass tech, Matt, who's standing over here, he's now our laser, he's our laser tech safety operator, which is something that you need when you're in New York State. So any show that we're in New York State, Matt's back with us um, as our laser safety officer. <laughs> and um, one thing he did was he moved us off of like, paper set lists and paper like charts and paper lyrics onto a, an amazing iPad system here, which is what, you know, a lot of the pros do. And then I have just like, you know, if, if, if we're pulling something up and it's one of the songs that's either new um, or where is it? That's, let's see. I could just pull up my entire, let's see. Here we go, go in here. I could pull up my whole song list here and I have every chart here. And you know, my biological age, I just found out last week through a series of like health tests that I took, is 40 years old, which is pretty good for a 50 year old. But, um, but at 50 with 190 or 220 songs, you know, it's a lot of lyrics, especially when you have like 35 new songs. So I'm able to have my charts here just to make sure um, that I'm on with the rest of the band. And that's a huge, huge upgrade. Another thing that's set on a foot pedal here. So if I just click on this foot pedal, I can page through all of my charts here. Super huge upgrade from, from where we were uh, living in the ancient past. But yeah, that's it. You know, these pedals here control my monitors for the keyboards and the guitar i go up here and the keyboards go up i go up here and the guitar goes up so you know i, I have less interaction not completely none but less interaction and then this is our talk back microphone you know i if i talk like this into it without my foot on the pedal i'm speaking to the crew basically all the crew is hearing what i'm saying and if i step on there like that then i'm talking to the band and the crew all together at the same time and so um, sometimes, like, I'll want to get the like, vocal up, but I don't want to, like, have my voice going into the ear of the dude who's singing while he's singing. So we have to separate the lines so that I'm not coming out into the band's ears. Almost 95% of what I'm saying into here doesn't go to the band because I, I, I want to make sure that I, I'm not shocking them out of the moment that we're in sure. the ear flow state. So that's it, that's the rig this year. You know, I'm still sticking with the 412 Aguilar rig, although the Bergantino people did tell me that they have some special speaker systems that they're building for um, a couple of artists. So for next yeah. year? I'm hoping next year there's gonna be some Bergantino speakers back here. And uh, they said they're working on a rig for Mike and, and, and hinted that it would be something that would be fitting for the biscuits as well. So here's hoping. Amazing. Anyway, thanks Ryan for, for taking a, a run through the, uh, the newest rig here.